Uh, if everyone could find a seat. Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, again from me uh, to the Institute for Government. Uh, my name is Hannah White, and I'm Deputy Director here, and it's great to see you all here to help us celebrate our 10th anniversary. So welcome, uh, I should say, to our first panel uh, session. We've had a, a wonderful opening keynote, um, and now we're going to dive into some of the more uh, uh, specific issues that we want to talk about in terms of the challenges that uh, modern governments are facing. And this first panel session of the day um, is looking at how governments have to think about developing their people, the capabilities and skills that civil services and public services need um, in order to meet the challenges uh, uh, that we all face today. And as we all know, it's really vital that civil and public services have the right skills and capabilities um, in order to deliver on the political priorities of politicians and to deliver public services for the public. And in the UK, I think we can say that in the past, neglecting some of those capabilities has led to some quite high-profile failures. Uh, we've had issues such, uh, relate, such IT related issues in relation to universal credit, for example, the cancellation of the intercity west coast franchise competi uh, rail uh, competition. Just a couple of examples of things where actually if you don't invest, these things can go wrong. But here in the UK, since 2013, the leadership of the civil service has really stepped up their efforts to try to prof professionalize key government activities. Um, and this is something that we've been very interested in and very keen on supporting at the Institute for Government. Um, so things like financial management, policy making, project delivery. Um, government is trying to take a more joined up approach to organizing this spe these specialisms. And this is something which is known as the functional agenda. Um, as I say, we at the Institute have been very supportive of, of this and we've been working very closely with functional leaders. Um, and at the, in the last year, we're really delighted that a majority of the functional leaders have actually spoken here at the Institute and, and laid out their uh, plans and talked about the progress that they're making. We're also very conscious, and this is a theme throughout our conference uh, today, that there is a lot to be learned internationally. These are common challenges that different countries are trying to face, trying to build skills and capabilities in their civil service. So I'm really delighted that we've got a great panel here today to talk about these issues. Um, so our three panelists Unfortunately, John, John Manzoni wasn't able to join us, um, but we're really delighted that in his place we have Nick Borwell, who is recently appointed principal of the Civil Service Leadership Academy, which supports senior civil servants in leadership roles here in the UK. Until recently, Nick directed the project delivery profession within the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, and that included developing the Major Projects Leadership Academy with the Said Business School. So he is very well placed to talk about the functional agenda. Uh, sec and second, we have Janine Sherman, who's joined us from Canada. She is Canada's Deputy Secretary to the Cabinet for Senior Personnel and Public Service Renewal. And she'll be able to bring a wealth of experience about Canada's um, experience to the discussion. And finally, we have Rob Seitner, who's from the United States Office of Management and Budget, where he works on federal human capital. So the way we're going to run this, we're going to have a, a few remarks, five minutes each from the panel. Uh, then I'll ask a couple of questions, and then I'll open it out to to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone sitting in the adjoining room and would like to ask a question when we get to that point, please follow the time on a tradition of sticking your head through the door and I will notice you. So I'll, I'll ask uh, Nick, I think, just to kick off um, and tell us a bit about his experience and where he feels the functional agenda has got to in the UK. Indeed. Well, happy birthday to the IFG, first of all. Uh, you've probably already said that. Um, it is always said we live in turbulent times, but I think now is it's really true um, and as a result the functional agenda across government has never been more important um, John Manzoni launched that um, a couple of years ago um, but actually it's, a, it's all just to explain what it is in case you're not sure the functional agenda, the agenda is all about developing um, a, a set of functions within government whether it's project delivery whether it's uh, commercial finance digital which actually um, operates effectively across all departments because every department is different every department is robustly independent and so if we can have a, a common way of working across uh, all our departments then that will allow us to deliver services more effectively to the citizen 
And so we now have a set of, project, uh, a set of functional standards. Uh, the first one produced was project delivery, which I was responsible for. Uh, and we've actually produced those standards now, and they're now being used across government. It's early days, because actually they were only finally prepared and, and, and uh, pulled together uh, last year. But actually it's starting to have an effect across the whole piece. Um, paradoxically, I, I won't get away without talking about Brexit, but I'll only went, say one thing about Brexit, and that is that that is that's sort of forcing departments to work even more closely together. So if you take the functional agenda, which is powerful at the moment, the requirement for departments more, to work more closely together to achieve um, uh, results together, actually we're seeing a more, more joined up government across the piece. The leadership agenda is important. Uh, different functions and professions uh, have their own leadership development, which is, is absolutely right and proper. Departments do as well. But my role now in the Civil Service Leadership Academy is to look at predominantly the 4,500 senior civil servants we've got across government and give joined up uh, leadership development in a coherent way to all SCS as they come into role, so that's senior civil servants. So when someone is appointed, within a, a few months they need to be enrolled on um, the Civil Service Leadership Academy leadership program appropriate for their level. And the great thing is, working on cohorts together, um, they learn together. So they're more likely to learn from each other than, frankly, from the faculty. The principle is leaders teaching leaders. So we have permanent secretaries and DGs, directors general, actually helping to deliver the program to our uh, senior civil servants. Now, it's early days yet. These programs are just being developed, but we've already started doing that with our leadership um, cohorts as they start to go through. I'm going to, I'm going to stop there, if I may, um, and um, maybe we'll have questions later. Okay, would you like to... Uh, thank you, yes. Um, I, I may take a little bit longer, but uh, I guess sharing our time is probably a, an indicator of international cooperation. Um, so uh, I'm always proud uh, to talk about Canada's public service. It is known uh, for stability, professionalism, nonpartisanship and excellence in delivering services to Canadians as well as uh, how we support the government of Canada. You know, but we don't take our successes uh, for granted. They're rooted in experience and practice, um, but we know we need to continue to renew. Uh, it's, a, it's a truth of uh, public sector service. And so in a time of accelerating disruption of, of change all around us, uh, we in the pu Canadian public service have developed a response um, that is aimed at making us more agile, inclusive, and equipped. And I'll get back to those points shortly, but I'll go a little bit through some of the, the um, uh, challenges and the things that are happening in our environment right now. Um, first of all, we know that public service needs to learn in their careers, um, but we also know now that they need to learn faster. Uh, we need to hire people who have an ability to gain new knowledge, not just for the knowledge they bring uh, to, the, to the job, we're in a knowledge-based economy, but it's being augmented now with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these are all opportunities for enhancing productivity. So we see um, that talent is obviously our most strategic asset in this kind of construct. And people are the greatest creators of value. So talent management is key. It's a top priority. And we need to be proactive about that, uh, not just talk about it, because we're often very good about talking about things. Um, but we need to focus on managing our talent, maximizing potential, both for the individual, but also to affect uh, change and, and uh, enhancement of the entire organization. So we work at considering leaders as an enterprise-wide resource. That's part of the way we think it's important uh, to manage succession and to have a strong bench of talent to draw from. Um, part of this is having the right people with the right skills in the right places at the right time. I'm sure you've all heard this. Uh, it's easier said than done. Uh, and it takes a lot of deliberate action. And so one of the things that we've turned to is the fact that managers at all levels across the public service um, need to make a stronger commitment to managing talent. We're taking a slightly new approach this year uh, to managing talent in the public, federal public service. Focusing in on attributes, so this is about who people, who they are as people. Things like their drive, their adaptability, curiosity and resilience. We also, of course, take uh, note of leadership competencies, how people behave in terms of mobilizing the workforce, 
promoting innovation, guiding change, and collaborating with stakeholders. And then we also look at specific know-how, which I, I think is much of uh, uh, what Nick has mentioned in terms of areas of expertise uh, and experience, whether they be corporate roles, policy program, technology. We need to know what skills people and what expertise they bring uh, to the workplace. Um, and I think in, in Canada, we have a number of strengths uh, it, within our, our structure. Um, we do have a robust human resources framework. Um, and it is aimed at addressing the complexity of the environment that our leaders work in, uh, working collaboratively, uh, accountabilities and the need for transparency has increased uh, remarkably over time. Social media is a reality of our work. It drives this insatiable public scrutiny uh, that, you know, in the past public service was not necessarily ready for. Um, and we're always trying to do more with less. I won't go into much detail on the framework. It's pretty, um, it actually isn't rocket science. There are things that <laughs> you're all familiar with, I think, in terms of developing people. But one of the emphasis that I will uh, maybe mention is the succession planning. Um, we do put a lot of emphasis on, in terms of our executive cadre and building uh, the, uh, the talent pool. Um, the majority of our senior leaders do come from inside the public service but we're working very hard at actually expanding um, our efforts to do external recruitment and, and to bring in an exchange of different perspectives. Um, we have this year done something fairly different in our, um, our senior leadership cadre, created what we call senior leadership circles. Uh, these are deputy ministers. We used to have a very core uh, group of deputies that focused on, on some of the people management issues. So we've widened that, we've created separate circles, so almost every deputy minister is involved in one of those. Um, and it, we are doing surveys, conducting some analysis about gaps, how we can better share information, how we can share best practices, and then in theory, um, we'll pull all that together, annually have a leadership summit, and try and then percolate out some of those concepts uh, that we've developed in terms of supporting uh, our succession management better. Uh, one of our other strengths, I think, is, is uh, a central learning provider. So we do have the Canada School of Public Service. It makes training available to all uh, public servants across the country. And we have a dedicated curricula as well for senior leaders. Um, so that focuses a lot on what we call core learning, the fundamentals of, of being a public servant. Some of those cross-sectional elements, uh, really, that apply everywhere. Uh, in departments and agencies. We also then have the benefit in the school of doing some more targeted learning. So learning that is aligned with government priorities. In Canada, there's a, a, a very important uh, reconciliation agenda with Indigenous people, so we have an Indigenous learning series. That's about resources, courses, and workshops that actually focus in on the history and the cultures, the rights and the perspectives of Indigenous people in Canada and their relationship with the Crown. Um, another area we've focused on recently is harassment prevention. So giving people the tools in terms of prevention, knowing when to act and restoring workplace well-being. Uh, Gender-based analysis. So this is something that the Government of Canada has put a very large focus on in terms of how we do program and policy development. So we try to make sure that all the people involved in those activities um, are learning about impacts in terms of diversity uh, across our policy uh, fields. And I wouldn't, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention informal training. Uh, we do a lot to encourage uh, peer uh, mentoring, uh, networking, coaching, and this goes both ways. We want senior leaders to learn from others in the organization and people in, in the organization to learn from senior leaders. And of course, we have some challenges. That all sounds pretty organized. Um, but we are uh, 270,000 public servants. We are uh, located in the second geographically largest country uh, in the world. And so we have to make sure we, we try and uh, address regional issues uh, and differences. 60% uh, of our workforce is in the regions. Uh, and so getting learning and, and ensuring access to uh, all of those people uh, across the country is a challenge. Uh, we've done a lot of work, and I think my colleague this morning mentioned online learning and, and learning from the experience of others like the Singapore uh, um, experience has helped us in terms of uh, expanding that reach. Um, 
So those are some of the specific areas, but we know we need to learn to be, to change our behaviors in certain ways. Becoming more risk tolerant uh, within our, our uh, public service. We need to be better at sharing information and data. This is pretty fundamental in a digital age. Uh, the inclusion of diverse uh, perspectives. Um, and all of this, as I mentioned earlier, is tied into our renewal agenda, uh, which we call Beyond 2020. This is where we put our focus on becoming agile, inclusive, and equipped. Um, and fundamental in that framework is the idea that we need to change and focus in on what we are calling mindsets and behaviors. We need to think about doing our work differently. We need to make sure we've got diversity uh, of perspective, of experience, of culture, and bring all of that to the table. That's part of the uh, inclusive uh, part of it. There's lots of science and evidence to tell us that um, diversity helps uh, improve results. It improves productivity. It improves the effectiveness of uh, programs and policies. So that is very key in terms of the outcomes. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are representative of the population that we serve in Canada. Uh, there's a lot of work to do on there. We, um, it's a constant effort, uh, but we're doing some important things in terms of uh, increasing our, our diversity and building that with inclusion. Uh, we also want to become better equipped. So for lots of people, this means technology. That is one element. Um, but it's also about the ways and the flexibilities that we offer to people in terms of how they work. Remote work, um, the ability to telework, obviously where geography is such a challenge, we have to think creatively about bringing uh, workers from all across the country into a um, opportunity where they can work for the federal government. And in doing um, all of this, and, and we are looking at engaging people in different ways. So we are working not just with silos in terms of departments and agencies, but we have a lot of networks uh, throughout the Canadian Public Service. And part of our renewal agenda has been to focus very uh, deliberately on these horizontal groups. We have a national managers community, we have a federal youth network, we have a, uh, a network of persons with disabilities, and we make sure that we try and do all of this sort of cross-sectional uh, engagement as well. And one of the most important things within this framework of Beyond 2020 is that while we've structured it around agile, inclusive, and equipped, and we know that at the core of that it's about mindsets and behaviors, it's very adaptable. We are totally different across the whole uh, scope of the federal public service, over 300 organizations uh, with lots of different structures and realities in their workplace. So this framework is actually adaptable and customizable uh, to almost anything from, you know, the reality of our, uh, our, our Corrections Canada, which is our prisons um, organization, uh, to you know, the place where I work, which is Privy Council Office, a lot smaller um, and very centralized. Uh, so no matter what your organization is and what you're about and what your mission is, you should be able to find your way into this framework uh, that will bring some cohesion in terms of how we renew ourselves. Um, how do we incentivize that? Uh, we also, through our performance review process uh, for uh, senior leaders, um, make sure that we have a series of, sort of everybody del delivers um, on various things within their own mission specific responsibilities, but we have what we also call corporate commitments. And those commitments um, are all about uh, the kinds of things, we're putting it all under the umbrella of the Beyond 2020 framework and deputy ministers will be sort of graded and, and assessed in terms of how much their activities and results are tied to the agile, inclusive, and equipped uh, uh, framework. It's not a one-off. We know that this is a journey. We started uh, actually this journey five or six years ago with uh, a more um, focused, uh, a broader a focus really on innovation, and, and we built that momentum around innovation over the last five years. This is probably going to take us another five or six years, but we're very uh, attuned to the importance of actually setting the right mindsets and behaviors. Um, I was asked just, I think, to also maybe, um, I don't want to take up too much time, Hannah, stop me. If, uh, <laughs> but uh, just to sort of speak about what some of our lessons are uh, in terms of the work that we're doing. 
Um, and I've just got a couple here, but structures. So we have, as I mentioned, the Canada School. It was created um, almost 15 years ago uh, out of three organizations within the federal public service, bringing uh, those entities together and creating this institution that uh, is available for public servants, that actually every public servant has a learning account and can access online learning, as well as um, uh, the um, seminars and things that are delivered in the National Capital Region are also accessible through webinar and online. So it's been a huge element of our ability to communicate out uh, and share best practices. Um, a common set of values and ethics. So federal public service is, is grounded in uh, a set of values and ethics that all public servants are expected to adopt and adhere to. And, and that is actually a, a, a sort of a grounding point for our mindsets and behaviors, and it helps to build a uh, common purpose. And then I think lastly, uh, introspection. Uh, we have, as I'm sure most governments do, uh, lots of layers of oversight and people ready to tell us how we should be doing our job better. Um, but that's important. We have lots of, we have auditor generals and commissioners of official languages and we seem in my other hat I wear is about public appointments and we seem to create uh, more and more of these commissioners as we go. Uh, but they are important sources of feedback and being responsive to those and acting on them and taking uh, the kind of uh, constructive criticism is very important in terms of always improving. Thank you very much. Well, you like to talk about yes. US experience. Thanks. Um, first of all, it is an absolute honor to be here. Um, congratulations on an exciting milestone. And I also think it's wonderful that we're starting with the first panel being on civil service, because realistically, there is a world of difference between politics and governing. And when you think about the civil service, that's the people, that's us, that is what is the underpinning of any functioning government and society. And if people lose faith in the civil service because of failures or other reasons, then realistically they're losing faith in the entire system. And the civil service is really often what differentiates countries in the delivery of services and being able to meet the mission of the country. So this is a great first topic. Um, to just give a little bit of background on the U.S. experience with the civil service, we have 2.1 million civil servants, which is about the same number we had in the 1950s. However, it is a complete 180 in the type of jobs and the rankings of grades of where we were then. So back in the 1950s, even through the 1970s, most of the U.S. government were clerks, secretaries, administrative staff, a lot of manual labor. Now that has been turned on its head, where well over half of federal civil servants have at least a, a bachelor's or a master's degree. We are the largest employer of some of the highest paid professions, so doctors, lawyers, uh, senior leaders of, for where we're competing with the private sector. We are also an aging workforce where the average age of our federal employees is just a, ha a hair under 50, and the gap is growing larger, where during the past four years, we've had a larger number of people in our technology fields who are older than 60, while the number of younger than 30, even in technology, is decreasing. With the 2.1 million, less than 6% of our workforce is younger than 30. Now, some of that also has to do with, as I mentioned, the changing nature of work, where, our, where we're trying to look and modernize our system is still very much rooted in an era where, frankly, it was developed while Churchill was still in office. That our classification system goes back to 1944, and we have not really been able to move far from it since a lot of our system is tied to having a pay system rooted in what was, at the time, scientific management and very innovative in the 1920s, but <laughs> now has really been keeping us from being agile and looking at how do you develop a more market sensitive, agile pay system. So much of our focus in the US, and when I'm saying much of our focus now, I am talking from the 30,000 foot level, looking at where can we make changes, recognizing that a lot of our policies are coming from law. With just the HR realm, we have almost 5,000 laws and regulations dealing with the management of the civil service. 
making changes, especially in, as you are well aware, we have a hyper-partisan uh, political situation in the US. And let me tell you, personnel management is the least sexy topic that you can imagine <laughs> to get any member of Congress actually interested in having this conversation. Therefore, what we're often stuck trying to do from within the civil service are figure out where can we have the greatest difference within the existing structure with the hope that we can start chipping away at the system. So the three places that we have really been putting a lot of our attention lately have to do with the assessment of new hires. That the idea of how do we find the right people within a very structured interview process and trying to move away from occupational questionnaires, um, different scenarios where you know basically everyone is an expert, everyone is you know the absolute leader of their field and starting to switch to how do we really see situationally how will people do in that job. This is especially important, important for our promotion and hiring of managers where quite frankly for decades since pay was tied to grade the only way to really receive more pay was to move into management. And one of the biggest lessons, at least we've seen in our country, is often the best technical people are the worst managers. That they really have no desire to be doing the management of people, the management of resources. They really want to be doing the actual work. They want to continue to get their hands dirty, but when you're forcing them into management to receive pay, how do we really start assessing and making sure that the people moving into the management roles really should be spending about half their time managing people and resources. The next place where we have spent a significant amount of time is on employee engagement. We recognize we can't compete with Google for the top talent. We're, nev we're never going to be able to pay seven-figure salaries, but what we should and be doing is making sure those who have chosen public service careers aren't hampered by unnecessary barriers. Um, and so we have in the US, um, UK, several other countries have an employee viewpoint survey, which is in the field right now. I um, can't wait to see the current results. But we usually receive more than 600,000 responses. And what we've done in the past five or so years, where we used to just be able to compare NASA to Homeland Security, we now have organizational unit breakouts available to the public of 28,000 work units. And we've actually collected um, almost 80,000 work units. It just has fewer than 10 responses. So we can start looking at the managerial level and co start comparing, even within the same division, manager to manager or city to city. And we've seen, within what should be the same job, a 50-point gap in engagement. And when you start seeing those starts of you know, either in agencies that generally had a history of being poor performers and that you see pockets of almost everyone highly engaged, to of the 28,000 units, we had about a dozen where with almost 100 questions, every single question was answered in the negative by every single employee. That's clearly an organization <laughs> screaming out for help. <laughs> so now that we can spot that, we can start looking at engagement. <laughs> And it really helps us focus where our attention most needs to be. The last place that I know is personally like my mission is trying to overhaul our performance management system, where right now we know poor performers are generally not addressed. At the same time, even if you are a top employee, there's not much of an incentive system. We don't have the bonus uh, potential. We, we don't have the training dollars. There's very little that we are able to really give employees. But what we can do is make sure that they have career development. We can make sure that they're receiving the performance management that they need. Generally, as I said, with most ma of our managers not coming up being trained to give performance feedback, not being able to work on effective performance management. What we had is the annual performance appraisal, which was a check the box, generally a very harsh feeling where managers would try to think of some good things, think of some bad things, but it was not much of a meaningful conversation. So now we, are, we actually have our first agency that is truly piloting an ongoing continual performance management system where there will be at least quarterly conversations about development, of making it a lot more of continual type of process. Because as we've seen is if you're only speaking to your manager once per year, 
you're either going to have the halo effect or the recency effect, but it's not going to really give you the chance for feedback. If you're talking to your manager for even five minutes a week about performance, that's 52 different options for feedback. That if you're doing well, your manager will see it. It's not you writing your own performance appraisal and everyone being outstanding because that's all a manager can do. If you're kind of missing the mark, your manager has the opportunity to start saying, okay, you need to adjust mid-course, which starts allowing a manager to also see if they're having that conversation you know, every week, every other week. It also will allow them to see who shouldn't be in the civil service anymore. We have a lot that we need to be working on. I, you know, we do need to try to figure out how to modernize a total compensation system. We need to make sure that the value proposition exists for civil service. We need to adopt to the reality of most civil service around the world were designed to have people hired when they were in their 20s with the intent that they were going to retire. And that's simply not the reality anymore. The markets and individuals no longer want to come in any career for 40 years. So how do we start adapting people to be able to go in and out of government in a fair way? Well, upholding public policy. We are always, as civil servants, going to be different than the private sector. Pri the civil service should not operate as a business. We do have a higher calling. We do have a different mission than the private sector. But that doesn't mean we can't try to figure out ways to make sure that we're working to get the top employees that we need at, as you said, at the right time in the right place. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. And I think it's really interesting to hear how these issues that governments are dealing with are indeed common. A lot of the same themes coming up across the panel in terms of pay, performance management, recruitment, engagement, how to keep and attract in the first place, I think, and then retain staff at a time when people aren't expecting to spend their entire career uh, in the civil service, and, and nor do we want them to. We want to be able to bring in talent, as you were saying, um, and then deploy it in the right places. And it's certainly something we've thought about at the Institute here in terms of um, how the civil service can retain and build expertise and keep it in the right place. We did a piece of work last year on turnover in the civil service, which found that um, in the Treasury, in the Cabinet Office, they lose a, a quarter of their staff each year in terms of, of turnover. Um, and senior managers in Whitehall, um, specifically in London, tend to stay in post for fewer than two years. And so that turnover just means that it's really difficult um, to retain expertise. How do you think the functional agenda is playing into that? Because it's very much, as Rob was saying, you know, that pay is the, is the, is the driving force behind yeah. this. You have to move... Uh, we found, you know, this is what, what civil servants feel. You can't get an uh, incentive to stay where you are, um, so you have to move to a different job. But how does that, you must have seen this play out in a sort of projects perspective yeah, in the I previous world. I think that, um, I mean, it's a, it's a key issue for us. I mean, I, I, I get into trouble for this all the time, but I describe uh, departments as planets. Some of them are dense and some of them are gaseous. And the reason I say that is that their characters are completely different. Um, and um, and the, the sort of more dense planets, if you like, are the ones which um, have um, deliver as well as set policy, if you like. Um, and so there's the Home Office, HMRC, and so forth. And so they have a lot of functions within them. The more gaseous planets are things like DHSC, Department of Health and Social Care, where they're predominantly dealing with policy, other things as well, of course, but they're delivering through arm's length bodies. And so, actually, we've got departments that are not only um, different, but actually have set the different pay rates as well between them. And so, mo moving between, if you're in Newcastle, for example, and, you, uh, and you've got DWP and HMRC there, HMRC pay better than DWP. Um, uh, and that's across a number of functions. And so we, we're looking at now, now how we can get a more standard approach, absolutely respecting and understanding the independence of departments. And so this is something we're actively looking at because in some ways, to get, to get a pay rise, you need to get promoted. Um, I take the point as well that not everyone is going to be a great leader. Um, not everyone is suited to every level of management, of course. Some people need to have great careers at the level they're suited, suited to, because we need those experts to do those jobs. And so we've got to be able to reward them uh, in those roles and not expect them to try and go for promotion, when in, in fact, they might not want to. 
and they might feel that they're, they're almost forced in that direction where it's unrealistic. So we're looking at that and the cross-functional agenda, certainly in project delivery terms, and it's, it's replicated across other functions. We have um, a capability framework which maps roles and competencies and what people are required to, to do in terms of, lead, of, of training and development to, to do the job they're doing and if they want to move on, what they need to do to achieve that and where they can go to achieve that as well. And we're looking at, at how we can standardise to an extent the pay across the civil service. But it, it, this is a long-term thing. This isn't going to happen overnight. Um, so I just want to sort of set expectations there. This is a highly complex thing to sort of unravel and, and emotionally quite charged as well, as you'll, you'll appreciate. So we are dealing with a, a, an organisation which is um, happily very disparate, actually, uh, has a lot of strengths within the departments and within the functions already. The, the key now is to ensure that those strengths are replicated across the other departments because we've got pockets of strengths and areas of development and that we're learning from each other, which is what we're seeking to do now. I think that's right. That uh, I take the point that not everyone would necessarily want to move into senior management. Mm. I think one of the things, though, that we've argued at the Institute is that people who have spent their career in a function mm. developing a specialism ought not to be prevented from getting into the most senior roles Absolutely. and having that yeah. pipeline through and those people with those skills and experience influencing decision making at the highest level is actually very important where those people are, are suited well, to that role. That, that, it's, it's a really good point actually. If you look at, you, took, you, you sort, of, uh, sort of rehearsed a sort of fairly grim litany of, of failures at the beginning, actually there have been quite a few successes as well, but we all know that we've had policy to delivery failures and problems. And so um, having a more joined up approach, a multifunctional approach to right at the beginning, if, if you think about rather than um, policy to delivery, if you think about ideas to outcomes. So right at the point at which people are thinking about things to do, the ministers quite rightly will want to make announcements about things. But maybe we don't need to be too specific about exactly what, by exactly when, for exactly how much, that actually if we couch that in slightly more realistic terms, then we can, we're can we more likely to deliver successfully. And that speaks to having more multifunctional teams right at the beginning of the whole process, rather than bringing experts in later on. And so that's what we're working to. And things like the Major Projects Leadership Academy, for example, um, we've put 600, nearly 600 people through that in the last five or six years. Uh, all deputy directors and directors. Some of those have been promoted since, which is great. A few have left, but not as many as you might think. Um, and half of those people are not project delivery professionals. They're from every other function you can think of because they're going to be senior responsible owners, not just project directors. And so that team working is vital. And in the Civil Service Leadership Academy, that's one of the things we're going to be looking to do as well. I think, helps. actually, I'm aware in Canada, one of the issues you've been thinking about is how to get people to move, to have a cadre of people who actually can be more flexible and move, and you've got your free agents. Free agents. Yeah, program. I don't wonder if you could say a little. Sure. Um, and that is one of the um, sort of outcomes from our earlier blueprint uh, initiative was the idea that people should be able to move easily across, uh, across government. So it is a pilot, um, it is small scale. The issue is always how do we scale up and make this kind of more, um, more available. But it's basically a system where people identify their, their skill sets. Uh, they have a home department, so they don't have to worry about having a job or not having a job. Um, but then they put themselves on the internal market inside the public service uh, based on a certain skill set. Um, managers can go and, and hire free agents. It can be for a six, 12 or 18 month term. Um, when you've got a project or a particular deliverable and, and you look on this, uh, you know, on, on the free agent site and, and find a person that might have the skill set, uh, you bring them in. There's sort of no hiring required. You basically sign an agreement. Um, and then they carry out the project uh, and work within your team. They develop you know, um, opportunities to increase uh, their expertise and, and we don't have to reinvent uh, all of that. 
Um, it is, I think, almost over 40 departments have availed themselves of this option, so they've brought people in. Most people find it really quite rewarding, both on sort of the, uh, the free agent side and, and the, the hiring side. Um, so they come and they go, and uh, it's, it's a great model, but scaling it up, uh, I think we're, we're sort of in the, you know, um, in the lower, um, less than 100. Um, certainly the experiences have been numerous, but there's only a few people that are actually doing this right now. The flip side of that is um, also an external facing program, uh, which we call Talent Cloud, uh, designed to sort of get at the gig economy and have some of these technological experts uh, out there that can come in and out of government as well. Uh, but again, they're, they're pilot projects. I think I better open up to audience questions now. So, can I ask you to think about what you might like to ask the panel? I'm going to start with Daniel. There is a roving mic. Yes. As I say, if anyone wants to come in from next door, please d stick your head around the door. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question for the Deputy Secretary, Canadian Cabinet. You said um, in your really interesting open remarks that you're looking for attributes competencies and know-how. I'm interested in the attributes part. What kind of are you looking for and how do you look for it and how does it feature into your talent um, selection and talent promotion? I think we'll just take one more question, uh, maybe two more questions and then we'll ask the panel to adjust. There's a gentleman there on the front of the second section. Uh, uh, John Burt, House of Lords. I wonder if I could press Nick. I uh, worked in the centre of government in the Blair here, and one of my responsibilities was to working with the then cabinet secretary to drive um, to drive civil service reform. Uh, the issue was not absence of talent. I think everybody uh, understood and appreciated this is as talented workforce as exists anywhere. But there was a massive shortfall of skill. Um, the functions were not professionalised. There was only one finance director right across Whitehall who had accountancy. Uh, skills, project management skills you referred to were uh, simply uh, appalling. The HR function, we heard some interesting things from Mr. Uh, Seidner, uh, was wholly unprofessionalized. It was, uh, uh, by and large, career civil servants were in all of these jobs. The, even the, civil, the, the generality of civil servants lacked a lot of basic analytical number-based mm -hmm. skills. Uh, if we looked across the, the permanent secretaries in Whitehall now, how many would we find, as in business, have MBA uh, level skills? What would we find uh, if we looked at the support functions about the degree of prof professionalization that now exists? Frankly, at the time I was working at number 10, this reform program, though led by the cabinet secretary, was a massive failure because the planets, as you described them, simply resisted it wholesale. And I think there was one more question just over there, which will take the full. Hi, um, thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I just wondered, um, a lot of civil service departments are facing constant demands or calls for change, uh, perhaps within their organizations. And I just wondered if there were any lessons learned that you could share with us on how you've supported people you've worked with or in departments in, in when actually delivering that change. Have there been any lessons learned in keeping people engaged and helping them while you've been bringing in a new IT system, for example, or something, something akin to that? Thank you. It's an excellent question uh, because it is pretty hard to do <laughs> um, and we're just starting. Uh, it does align with um, a, um, a, uh, a methodology around character-based uh, leadership um, and it requires assessment of individuals so it's pretty labor intensive um, but we will be approaching it through um, the um, uh, assessment in terms of, I can speak a little bit about um, in terms of our appointments process, uh, we will put people through psychometric assessments and that will tell us things about their characteristics, their personality structure, if you will, uh, but then we will try and align that in terms of these kind of traits and this kind of a job may or may not be a match. It's things we know about, you know, working in a very detailed quasi-judicial role versus something that is much more uh, creative and transformative. 
um, and that will help us in terms of, of uh, assigning fit. To do this uh, more generally inside the public service, um, we will be doing some of these assessments um, through performance feedback, through, uh, you know, sometimes 360s, but really these kind of psychometric assessments um, are the basis. At this point, um, as in introducing it, we're doing it fairly informally, where an individual will rate themselves in terms of some of these uh, attributes and competencies, uh, and then the manager will rate them, and we'll look for divergence, uh, hopefully convergence, but you'd be surprised how often, which tells us something interesting too, um, an individual's perception of themselves versus their manager's perception can be quite different, and, and that's a conversation uh, to have that helps to feed into the performance review. Do you want to tackle the challenge from John? Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, no, I recognize that actually. And what's interesting is over the last two and a half years, um, despite some major distractions, and they're not distractions, of course, they're core to what we're doing at the moment, um, the drive to professionalizing the civil service has actually grown. Uh, the cross-functional agenda is part of that. Um, the sharing of information between those functions, so um, whether it's around the assessment um, work that's been done in the commercial profession under Gareth Reeves Williams, which has been really uh, groundbreaking, whether it's the stuff around uh, project delivery and the um, major projects leadership academy, uh, and actually uh, academies that uh, at, at Cranfield for the project leadership program, which is for below SCS as well. Uh, we're really working very hard to develop that professionalism. Um, understanding that although we need to develop the professionalism in, in professions, that actually the systems leadership is absolutely vital. How that comes together to deliver the whole is really important. So we've got to be able to do both, and we're working very hard to do both, and I think we're making, making ground now. Uh, it's probably too early to say what the effect is yet because of the lead time, particularly around things like some of the major programs that we're looking to, to deliver. We're reporting more accurately on them, so you won't necessarily see a, an improvement in them yet, but I think that'll be a lag which we'll, we'll see improvement to. Can't prove that, but I'm confident that we're going in the right direction. Um, I think the permanent secretaries, whilst guarding their independence jealously, and I'm, I'm not saying this to butter anyone up or to you know, curry favour, I don't need to do that, but actually we've got a very, very vibrant group of permanent secretaries who understand the requirement to work more closely together and uh, develop professionalism as well. So although there is that sort of independence, we're seeing a huge willingness to work closely together. So under what are currently, as you would appreciate, very difficult circumstances for the civil service, but they're doing it extremely well, um, I think, anyway. I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's where we're going. So you say it's, it's, it's early to tell, and, um, but you're confident we're going in the right direction. What are the sorts of milestones you think we should be looking for in terms th of yeah, um, time scales? I think, um, I, I'll give you a couple of examples actually. If you take universal credit when, you know, the advice was it's going to take a lot longer to deliver this thing than has been announced in the first place. And after two years of Western front levels of, of attrition on project directors, program directors and SROs, um, it was all re-baselined. And sure enough, it's going to take a lot longer than anyone had anticipated at the beginning. Um, well, not that anyone had not anticipated, but actually uh, there was a rebase line that got us where we needed to go with it. Um, we now have far less um, turnover in those teams. People are, it, it's balanced. People have got the professional training through things like Major Projects Leadership Academy. So you look at DWP now, they've got very strong teams that are delivering a very difficult program now, whatever you may read in the press and so forth. <coughs> The, the what has happened over the last few years has been a, a, a complete difference to what it was five years, six years ago. And I think it's partly because there's a confidence in the civil service, partly, and partly there's a competence that comes through that professional development which is pulling it together. And there are other examples as well. Court, courts reform where the advice was listened to, teams were being properly constituted, and although these things will always be difficult, actually we're seeing far less turbulence, far less churn than we had before. People are sticking to their jobs, and they, are, they seem to be enjoying it more. I might be overstating that, but they seem to be enjoying it more. <laughs> well, would you like to tackle sure. the change question? How you so with change, um, 
within our country, we have what's called the president's management agenda. Each president has one where we pick certain topics that have cross-agency implications, and each time we have one on the workforce, uh, civil service workforce. Two of the three of our um, pillars this time have to do exactly with how do you manage change. So one of them, it's we've already identified about 5% of our existing civil service are in jobs that frankly have already been eliminated in the private sector through automation or they're just excess types of positions. But we have one of our three pillars is working on reskilling, upskilling, retraining, and trying to work with people who are in those positions instead of saying, we were looking to eliminate you as a civil servant. We were trying to work with them to try to figure out, well, how can we train you for some of the areas that are either we have a critical shortage, or how do we work with them to evolve, to use new technology, to move into different positions so that they don't become obsolete and that we are able to keep people who have already shown that they have a commitment to civil service. The second one, as I mentioned before, has to do with the employee engagement concept. And that, this is something that, you know, frankly, I'm stunned, has actually leaped administrations. And it's something that I believe is one of the more global things that we're seeing in public administration. That uh, the OECD, the World Bank, they're looking at this globally in all different public administrations, all different governments. And what we're really seeing to try to help manage that change are what are, by asking employees very specifically, what do you need to be engaged? We, we're seeing it's not a matter often of, you know, the, the toys that you'll get in the tech sector, you know, the, the free lunches that don't really exist. It really, it's a matter of employees want to be able to talk to their managers. They want to be able to have their skills assessed and being able to develop. A lot of what needs to be done is quite simple. And within the U.S., um, where we really kicked off this initiative at the very end of uh, 2014, we are seeing our engagement scores continue to climb despite very public um, issues that, during the past few years from multiple government shutdowns, from um, honestly a lot of hostile rhetoric towards civil servants, really poor recruiting um, slogans such as drain the swamp and government is the problem, that the civil service really often is under assault in a lot of the media, a lot of the rhetoric. But our engagement is going up because of a lot of the little things that we are now seeing matter from the one-on-one -on -one communications, from being able to have the better technology, the better uh, tools to do the job. And when I look throughout our government, when I speak to the executives of the agencies that have really started to move up, most of the solutions that they've implemented are quite simple. A lot of them don't cost much money. Um, some of them are, are simple policy changes. Sometimes it's you know, changing. In, in one of our agencies, they didn't have microwaves in the kitchen still. And that came up, and when the the minutes, this was our Secretary of Labor, when he found out about it, he made sure to get microwaves in the kitchens. And those little things, the fact that the employees were heard, even their largest union president made a point of saying he had been working in the department since the early 1970s, and he never thought these changes would be made, but people were actually being heard. So the very nature of saying, we want to hear your voice, give us specific examples of how we can improve, and then from the management side, actually saying, we heard your voice, we made these changes, that has had a, a tremendous success already. And this is a, an area that like, I'm, I'm really proud of seeing that the World Bank is calling in countries. OECD a couple of years ago did a study where it included all of its members. Most of us now have uh, engagement surveys, and we were able to kind of lay the results, and you could not tell the difference between the US and Australia, Estonia and the, the UK. Most of us saw the same like peaks of engagement, the valleys, the age of when employees were least engaged, when the engagement returned. And the more data you have that looks at it, the more we're able to focus our policies on improving the employee experience. That's very interesting. I think Unfortunately, we're going to have to put, draw this session to a close because we have a very tight schedule today and we have 15 minutes to get anyone who's 
not going to be at our next session, which is going to be an excellent session on managing spending and... No, I'm no we're not. No. Uh, we do, because we've changed the... We've changed, yep. <laughs> <laughs> There is, uh, the, yes, the, uh, the uh, political agenda has changed again, and we have two MPs in our next session, and the parliamentary, uh, um, uh, their commitments in Parliament have meant that we're, we're doing a very interesting piece of choreography, but the next session is definitely starting uh, at 11.45. But I hope uh, we, you will, before that, join me in thanking this uh, panel very much. For